Uh, Peter John studied at the University of Cape Town, studied law. He taught law there for a short time, then entered the seminary, studied in Rome. Um, and as many of you know, I've been going to Cape Town for two months of the year for the last 14 years. One of my great friends is uh, Peter John Pearson. His role uh, is he's the uh, liaison officer for the Catholic Bishops' Conference uh, to Parliament. And so when I want to find out what's really going on in government in South Africa, I ask Peter John. He was also a leader in the struggle against apartheid, so some of his good friends uh, from his childhood years are now in the cabinet of South Africa. So it's a great source of intelligence. Uh, <laughs> come up, Peter John. I'm not sure about the latter, but um, <clears throat> I think part of what I want to do is to respond to some of the things that Bishop Darling said by way of my initial brief, which was to summarize or introduce. It changed with every email. Um, and I think that one of the ways I can accommodate that moving, um, that moving title is to just um, respond to, to some of the things. Using also some of the slides, in South Africa today, 21st of March is Human Rights Day. And for those who are aware of the huge quantum leaps that were made before 94 and after 94, um, it's a wonderful day on which to reflect um, some of the areas of, on some of the areas of justice and some of the areas of cooperation and some of the areas of bringing what seemed like irreconcilable forces into a working relationship um, for the good of people. So um, I want to respond to some of the things that, um, that, that, that Bishop Kevin said. The eight, or in some countries like Afghanistan, there's a ninth developmental goal, which um, is around the um, areas of good governance. The fundamental challenge that I think those um, goals raise is to provide, a, to provide content to the pledge that was made decades before 1945 that framed the world's hope at the birth of the UN. And that was, in the words of the fifth and sixth chapter of that charter, to promote social progress and better standards of life in the context of larger freedoms. And Secretary General Ban Ki-moon speaks about the MDGs as being designed to develop um, the lives of the world's forgotten um, bottom billion. And and somewhere in all of that, there's a consistency. Somewhere in all of that, there's a coherency to transform structures, to transform the experiences of the lives of people so that they might live lives that are fully human. And so I want to suggest that the first thing that I think is helpful and useful needs to be honored in the implementation of the eight MDGs is that it must be seen as a trajectory that has a coherency between the founding principles of the UN and the, the host of organizations and the, um, and the paradigm shifts in the thinkings of institutions such as the faith communities to problematize and to find a way out of the difficulties that marginalized people find themselves in that stunts their growth. The bottom billion are those people that Bishop Kevin spoke about, those incredibly, um, um, st those statistics that one doesn't understand until, as he said, one touches the hand um, of that person. I'm always struck in that regard by that very poignant description of the of the tragedy that these statistics represent um, in a um, in, in a comment by Anup, Anup Shah, where he says, speaking of those who die of poverty, and they die quietly in some of the poorest villages on earth, far removed from the scrutiny and conscience of the world, being meek and weak in life makes these dying multitudes even more invisible in death. And there's something horribly haunting and terribly challenging 
about that. We know these, um, these goals well, and there's no need to go into them um, in any detail. But how do we begin to use the um, insights and the wisdom that they represent to match the problems that Bishop Kevin outlined for us? I suppose there are several ways one can look at it. You could look at it in terms of the um, progress that has been made so far, and there there has been progress. I've culled some of it from various literature, and, um, and one can't underplay and underestimate what that progress represents in the lives of, um, of people who suffer. They, they do make a difference. One could also, I suppose, have a discussion around those things that undermine the project, those systemic um, issues that still undermine the potential for good that these goals have. And one could um, frame one's discussion in those terms. They are um, areas that need to be discussed. Or I suppose one could ask some of the, frame a discussion in terms of some of the most commonly asked questions about the MDGs. I looked at it on one of the websites, and for those of my generation um, who were raised in, 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 in the Roman Catholic Church, it sounded a bit like the penny catechism. You know, um, starts with, are millennium devol- development goals affordable? Yes, they are affordable, and then gives a four-line um, uh, uh, explanation. Do MDGs make good economic sense? And then four lines of answers, all very clinical and all very clean and all very uncontested. Um, One could begin a discussion around that. But in the three minutes more that I have left to me, I've thought I'd go a different route. I'm neither an economist nor am I a developmental theory um, expert. I'm trained in theology. And so I thought in a way that one never does at academic conferences. I'd actually look at a foundational text um, in the tradition that I'm familiar with, and I apologize for those um, who do not find um, a foundational text, scriptural text, useful or helpful or even conversant with it. But just um, indulge me for a moment. Um, No. We could assess it um, also in terms of some of the contested areas that we can um, find in the literature. But I want to look at Luke 16, 19 to 31. Those of you who know the um, story, it's the story of the poor man Lazarus um, at the gate of the unnamed rich man who um, sits there day after day and um, is basically ignored by the rich man, and the rich man dies, and he goes to heaven, and he doesn't, he goes to, to hell, and, um, and he says, hey, hey, you know, I'm a nice guy, I'm nice guys aren't supposed to go to hell, um, but I see the guy who sat outside my house is in heaven, why didn't you tell him to go and tell, talk to my brothers, and um, tell them what will happen if they don't, and, and, and uh, he's told, no, they've got the prophets, if they don't listen to them, um, they're not going to, um, to listen to anybody who's come to, to speak to them. Three points, I think, that that story raises, three challenges that I think ought to also become challenges for those who are looking at the MDGs. The first is the very language of that text suggests that that man sat there. He didn't go away. The fact that he had a very paltry reward for his sitting there didn't, in fact, deter him from continuing to sit there. And I think whatever the MDGs represent, they represent that man in that there is an increasing obstinacy, if you like, that the poor will not allow themselves to be invisible. They raise areas of challenge by their being there. And the story that um, Luke recalls um, means that we've, we can't ignore them. We can't ignore them. They will not allow us to ignore them. They, by their presence, raise challenges to which we have to respond. The second point that I think 
is made. Yeah, I, um, I've, I've added a quote there from a recent book on the, on the state of South Africa by Anthony Butler, a South African academic, who was reflecting on the 2008, this might be a little parochial, but it makes a point, um, the 2008 um, explosion of xenophobia in South Africa, um, where he says, for the New York Times, South Africa is once again the powder keg of frustrated hopes and disappointed expectations. The attacks on African migrants have increased political instability at a time of dissatisfaction with Mbeki's pro-business policies. Soaring food and fuel prices have helped tensions to a have helped push tensions to a breaking point. And I think the point I wanted to make by including this quote was the fact that there is a language that this article carries in it a language of desperation that I think honestly and um, indicates the kind of urgency there is in having to deal with people who will not allow themselves to be invisible anymore. The second um, point that I think is, is important is that that man, the rich man, did not land up in hell because he was cruel to the poor man. There's no indication that he was abusive or that he was um, cruel or anything. He simply went there because he had the resources to do something and he didn't do it. And I think there is a huge challenge and the Millennium Development Goals do begin to try and rectify this, try and take us, if you like, out of the possibility of landing ourselves in a hell by saying that there are resources that we have that we can use. The difficulty and the sadness, as that slide indicates, is that we are not even using them as best we can that countries are not, ev that the most developed countries are not even meeting that 0.7% that they are um, encouraged and have covenanted themselves to providing for aid to poorer countries. And the third point that I want to make is that those, that that man, that poor man, Lazarus, wasn't born at the gate of the rich man. He actually made a decision that that would be a good place for him to begin to move out of his poverty. And I think there is a real point there, and it's a point that Bishop Darling alluded to. The poor have ideas about how to get out of their poverty. There is an agency that they have. The agency of the poor, the agency of the oppressed, the agency of the marginalized, these are things that are being spoken of. And those of us who have a commitment to journeying alongside the poor need to understand that they have something to say. They have something to say about their poverty, they have something to say about how to, what kind of future they envisage. They have something to say based on their experiences about how to get from where they are to where they want to be. And we have a primary responsibility to listen to it. We have a primary responsibility to be alongside them, to complement the deficit in resources and skills that Bishop Darling was talking about with our own um, skills and our own insights and our wisdom and together be able to make a difference. And so the Millennium Development Goals as a sign of, of um, the world's response to the inventory of social pathologies, the call to respond to the 
urgency of the claims and the, um, of the poor, the call to use our resources and to deepen our understanding of what needs to be done, more comprehensive understanding of the justice that is at the base of all of um, the strivings for a better world, the call to respect and to listen to the agency of the poor and to work and strive alongside them. I think these are three areas that we must ensure are part of the way in which we implement the Millennium Development Goals. On paper, they speak well to the, to the pathologies of our time. In implementation, they will become far more respectable if we also listen and incorporate these values that I think can be drawn from this, um, from, from, from this story um, of that, um, that Luke um, presents to us. Um, just a, a little quote from um, the, one of the martyred Jesuits in El Salvador speaking about the need um, to prevent things from falling apart in a, in a disastrous and mortal fashion and the call to help change it from within. I see an echo of that in the Millennium Development Goals and it is our joint responsibility to make good things happen so that the poor need be poor no more. Um, that I would posit as a response to Bishop Darling's paper. Thank you. <laughs>